While still quite young, he said, I had already experienced almost every pleasure and disappointment, every happiness and every suffering, which can befall a man as a social animal. It would be useless to give you the details. The repertory of possible happenings in a human life is fairly limited, and it always comes down to about the same story. It's enough to say that one day I found myself alone and fully convinced that I had finished one cycle of existence. I had travelled a great deal, studied a variety of improbable sciences, learned ten odd trades. Life dealt with me a little the way an organism treats a foreign body. It was obviously trying either to insist me or to expel me. And for my own part I yearned for something else. After a time I believed I had found that something else in religion. I entered a monastery, a very strange one. Its name and location make little difference, but... To say the least, it belonged to a distinctly heretical order. In particular, there was a curious custom in the rule of the order. Every morning, our superior handed to each of us, we were about thirty in all, a slip of paper folded twice. One of these slips bore the words, Tuhodi, and only the superior knew which of us received it. Moreover, I believe that on certain days all the slips were blank, but since no one knew, the result was the same, as you'll see. Your turn today. It meant that the brother, so designated, without the others knowing it, would play the part of tempter all day. In certain African tribes and elsewhere, I've witnessed some fairly horrible rituals, such as human sacrifices and cannibalistic rites, but in no religious sect or practice of witchcraft have I ever encountered so cruel a custom as this institution of the daily tempter. Can you imagine thirty men leading a communal life already half crazed by the perpetual terror of sinning, looking at one another obsessed by the knowledge that one of them, they don't know who, has been specially commissioned to test their faith, their humility and their charity. It was like a diabolic caricature of a compelling idea, the idea that in my fellow man, as in myself, there is both a person to hate and a person to love. An excerpt there from... René Dumal's 1952 novel or novella, but I'll get to that. Mount Analogue, a novel of symbolically authentic non-Euclidean adventures in mountain climbing. Usually known and referred to simply as Mount Analogue. Uh, it was originally published in the French in 1952 and then published in English in 1959. And the reason I say uh, novella or novel, it clearly was intended to be a full novel, but uh, it quite literally stops mid-sentence because uh, René Dumal died before finishing it. And the story goes that he was writing it and someone knocked at his door and he quite literally finishes mid-sentence. And then he never got, never returned to writing the novel and, and died before even finishing the sentence. So we have we have sort of um, half a half a novel. So in, in a sense, it, it's become a novella with um, uh, a fairly lengthy uh, introduction by Roger Shattuck, uh, who also translated it. It's a peculiar, uh, it's a peculiar, surrealist, spiritual, allegorical novel, um, leaning emphatically on the notion of literary uh, analogy. Uh, hence Mount Analog. Um, before I begin to describe the novel, uh, I should mention that this is really uh, Dormal's most well-known book. Uh, another is um, A Night of Heavy Drinking, I believe it's uh, called, and they both roughly around the same themes of a spiritual seeker. Uh, Dormal himself was um, uh, a surrealist, he was within surrealism and Dada. He also learned Sanskrit, but most notably, um, he was a student of George Gurdjieff's, and he also was great friends with uh, one of Gurdjieff's other pupils, uh, Alexander de Salzman, who was the son of Jean de Salzman, who was one of Gurdjieff's truly most notable pupils. Anyway. All that to say that um, this book, in a sense, is is uh, completely 
allegorically structured around the teachings of the Fourth Way and the teachings of Gurdjieff, whilst at the same time allegorically discussing what it is to uh, ascend the spiritual mountain, so to speak. So to begin with the plot, the author, and I will intersperse readings throughout the plot to carry it along, um, the author receives an envelope um, from someone inquiring about him uh, concerning a an article that the author himself, who is also the protagonist in a way, Domal himself, or really speaking for seekers, um, receives an envelope to s inquiring about an article that he has written about this m this mountain called Mount Analog, and the writer of this letter is writing to him to inform him that it very much does exist. There's sort of this doubt about uh, this mountain even existing, but he's writing about him about an expedition up it. His name is Pierre Sogol. Or Sogol is S-O-G-O-L, Logos in reverse. Now immediately what's interesting is the author, both Domal and then in the sense of the protagonist and in the sense of us as the reader understanding what he's doing, um, is metatextual. Um, he's extremely transparent uh, and meta about the notion of mountains in the sense that he's writing. Not only is Mount Analog, you know, this, this book itself an allegorical tale about what uh, about about the notion of allegorical spiritual ascent up the mountain um it's also itself referring to itself and that idea within the book so it's sort of triple layered in that way you know the article that the person who writes to the author is referring to is the article itself this sort of possibly fictional article is an overview of the myth and symbolism of mountains and ascents throughout religious and spiritual history um However, what we find very quickly is that Mount Analog is inaccessible to ordinary human approaches. Um, and what these people, these expeditioners, will be looking for is a visible door to the invisible. But we immediately find that what we're really seeing here is something that comes into existence in a peculiar fashion. This Mount Analog, this possibility of ascent, and whatever this mountain may very well be, and this possibility of expedition, um, only exists in the sense that all these people already know that it exists. So they've already found uh, small inclinations of the possibility of this ascent, and of this thing which is somehow invisible, yet it's become invisible for them. Um, it only exists because they already all know it exists, but in the sense that they need they wish to ascend it there is an emphasis on only really being able to do that as a group uh, or at least at the very minimum as a, as a duo and we see this as the author seeks out this uh, Pierre Sogol uh, has to go through some somewhat extreme means to find him sort of uh, in the quintessential search for the mystic on the mountain or the mystic in this in this case in a very peculiar room um, and finds that uh, this Sogol's room is filled with human knowledge, diagrams of plant cells, the periodic table, uh, anatomy drawings, all this very systematic uh, knowledge which has been accumulated throughout human history, inclusive of very, uh, a lot of esoteric diagrams and knowledge. We have the knowledge, we have the seekers, we have um, also the acknowledgement that this ascent, that this mountain itself exists, this mountain really that we all understand immediately as... Um, the mountain up to something higher, up to the above. Um, and this is at the point where the the passage that I read, read out, Sogol now solidifies what perhaps what it is that uh, needs to be in place for us to be able to begin to see this mountain, and it's what Sogol mentioned in that reading, that he has experienced everything that life has to offer, and he's even at the point of saying that Perhaps this cycle is done and I'll just need to try again. But the point being is that he's experienced everything of um, the, all of that which is not the mountain. Um, and then he goes through this idea of temptation and this idea of being the tempter in the monastery. Uh, this is in relation to, biographically speaking, in relation to Dormal's relationship with Alexander de Salzman, who he, he calls a, and this is in the introduction, something like an ex-Benedictine, ex-monk, ex, all these things, like he's gone through it all and he's, he's come out the other side with a, with a knowledge of, of existence, you know, I have experienced all things of the world, now what? And this is really seems to be the foundation of what needs to be in place before one can even begin to see the visible door to the invisible, which is 
uh, very much in line with St. Teresa of Avila's notion of the interior castle, which many people overlook, which is that before you can even begin to enter the castle, you have to, you have to be in a position where you don't care about anything of the world which is before it. Um, he equally makes it clear that he's ever had a very pure experience of, um, of death. Um, and so we have these two sort of uh, positions, one of everything of the world, is gone. It's it's given him everything that he that there is to be uh, offered. And on the same hand, uh, at the same time, there is this understanding of one's mortality, um, of the fact you're not going to be around all that long, and you have a have, have a certain amount of time to um, do whatever it is that needs to be done. So the world has been pushed away, and one has perhaps had an internalization of how death will be and why it's. Uh, uh, a pure experience of death. And so upon meeting uh, this Sogol, there is now two of them, and Sogol makes it emphatically clear what was once impossible now becomes possible because of their meeting. And this is very much in line with Kajifian teaching that really, outside of, um, we could say, the extremes of human existence, uh, singular, singular teachers, Jesus, Buddha, Gurdjieff himself, Steiner, etc., these singular figures who somehow had something given to them, afforded to them from the above to, to allow them a singular energy, an individual energy. Um, the majority of seekers and human existence isn't going to be like that. Only, these things are only possible because of group work, and so what was once impossible on one's own, just this inclination of the mountain, of a mount analog, um, becomes possible now with a group and for Gurdjieff this is due to friction you need you can't uh, mo the majority of people are unable to see their own oversights biases habits problems internal problems um, themselves because the same self that has those problems is looking back onto the self and thus doesn't really have the ability to see them so you need the friction of someone else who can see you as you are to be able to begin this process of really picking away at yourself and waking you up from sleep in Kajifian terms. Um, and so there's this notion of the world. We, 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 before we can travel up, begin the ascent, the allegorical ascent up the mountain, the world has been pushed away. We've, we've put death before us as this thing, which is definitely going to be. And then there is an examination of the self as an alien. And then there is this, this, this reading um, before everything really begins to get up. Uh, begins to get underway. There, on a summit more pointed than the finest needle, he who fills the space resides under himself. On high, in the most rarefied air, where all freezes into stone, the supreme and immutable crystal alone subsists. Up there, exposed to the full fire of the firmament, where all is consumed in flame, subsists the perpetual incandescence. There at the centre of all creation is he who sees each thing accomplished in its beginning and its end. That is what the mountain people chant up there. That's what it's like. You say that's what it's like, but if it gets a little cold, your heart turns into a mole. If it gets a little hot, your head is filled with a buzzing of flies. If you go hungry, your body becomes as useless as a bulky mule. If you are tired, your own feet mock you. And so it's made clear that this isn't going to be an easy ascent. This is nothing simple about this, um, about what's uh, what's going to happen here. And so people begin to arrive, and they begin to arrive at what is being called the laboratory. And for Gurdjieff, this is very key. Not only would he consider himself an objective scientist, but the notion of error and testing and of failing and of constantly falling back asleep and then waking up. There is no clear path like this. There is no straight line up the mountain. You go, oh, there it is. And you just walk straight up with no problems. The mountain and mountaineering as an allegory is this constant overcoming both of self, of passions, of uh, our natural inclinations to food and and fatigue and tiredness and pain uh, whilst equally pushing ourselves away from the world and finding something new but the, the 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 beauty of the allegory of mountaineering is until you've been up there you don't know what's there so you're pushing through with faith the mountain itself is understood as this connection between 
the below and the above. And um, Dormal actually goes into very peculiar, almost quantum physical or strange notions of physics, which actually make the mountain uh, uh, be something that could actually possibly empirically exist. And he even goes to the extent of describing how big the circumference would have to be, how it is that people would empirically miss it if they were sailing towards it, if it was on an island. And this is to do with tensions and bodies and like a, a current which is around the island, which unless you know about it already, you simply believe you're in a straight line, but the straight line has actually been uh, a skewed sort of like a zero point around the mountain. So you, you sail straight, but it's because of a, uh, an allegorical tension around the mountain that you, you miss it altogether. And that's really a, a very peculiar quantum physical description of sleep. And so uh, they meet in the laboratory and there's um, all the people who are going to go on this expedition meet, 12 in total, uh, a spiritually significant number. Each of them, it's made clear, has their own appreciation of mountaineering. Each of them has their own uh, thing that they've um, crystallized in terms of spiritual seeking and is bringing to the table. Some of them eventually fall away and there's only a certain amount, few people who get to the, could fully undertake the expedition. Um, and Sogol at this point begins to describe, you know, the expedition in more empirical detail, that the mountain um, is, of course, taller than any any existing. And, of course, there's this peculiarity that to even know of the mountain and to, be, to even begin the ascent up the mountain proper, it has to be acknowledged that there must be humans who inhabit the bottom of the mountain to therefore understand that there are paths of entry. It's this peculiar nature of the allegory and the understanding of spiritual seeking in that you are seeking an invisible which has been made visible and so you need to find people who are already, already there and this is very much in in line with the teaching of Gajifian hierarchy of the stages of spiritual seeking in that uh, the seven levels so to speak if you wish to go from level three to four not only do you have to meet someone from level four uh, to be able for them to be able to say look you know here's well for them to Im imbue you and pass on intuitively what it is to be on level four. This is all very rough and quantitative, by the way. Someone on level five has to bring them up at the same time, etc., etc. So there has to be this pro uh, processual uh, movement of the spiritual hierarchy. But you have to, there has, in this sense of the mountain existing at all, there is an acknowledgement of there has to already be people there, a very peculiar uh, notion. And so... Just before they um, begin to set out, some letters arrive, and one arrives, and there is a reading of the lay of the luckless mountaineers. The tea tastes of aluminium, twelve sleeping bags for thirty men, everyone snug as a smothered bug, then off before the cracking dawn, breathing air like razor blades between deathly black and deathly white. My watch had the sense to stop. Yours has gone on a spree. We're smeared to the elbows with honey. The skies all curds and whey. It's light before we get going. The neaves already turned yellow. It's already raining pebbles, and the cold seeps into your hands. Who put gas in the drinking water? Our fingers swell like sponges, and the rope feels like a telegraph pole. The shelter's jumping with fleas. Our snoring sounds like the Paris Zoo. My ears cracking off from frostbite. You look like a half-trussed duck. I can never find enough pockets. My compass went out with the prune pits. Like a good boy scout, I forgot my knife. So pass me that folding sabre of yours. We've been climbing for 25,000 hours, and we're not yet in sight of the lower slope. All that chocolate is corked as tight. You're slogging in cheese when you break through the glaze. The cloud tastes like nitric acid, and you stare two paces into solid white. Hold up so we can set ourselves straight, my knapsack's beating instead of my heart. It's skipped out way back for sea level. And holes, what holes, green going to black, with gurgling sounds and chemins de fer. Ten thousand pockets in the moraine, false pockets, real holes, who knows. What's a broken leg on a mountain top? Here's my showers. Let's have your stew pan. We'll see it through on prudence and prunes. Just wait till the glacier splits its sides. They'll find us by our bushy beards. Space itself has turned to sleet. We've taken the wrong couleur again. 
I can hear your knees from here, old man. This rock ledge won't give up. You know what I have? A memory block, a stomach cramp, a flaming thirst, and two fingers turned pale green. We never did see the summit, except on the sardine can. The rope jammed on every pull through. We passed a lifetime untangling the line. And came to our senses with the cows in the dell. Have a good climb. First rate, but tough. And so Domal makes it clear that uh, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be problems. You're going to be, uh, there's a great emphasis in a very good Gfian sense. There's a great emphasis throughout the whole book on the intricacies of actually the material reality of going up the mountain, the need for possessions, the need for tools, the need for knowledge, and the need that, and, the, and the fact that all of these things are slowly going to get thrown away, fade away, get damaged. But this need that you, you can't just immediately give up the world to be able to run up the mountain. There has to be actually a very practical and, in a way, systematic ascent. Otherwise, you just get caught up in the clouds. People always forget, you know, their famous saying, head in the clouds, feet on the ground. Well, most people who have their head in the clouds don't have their feet on the ground. And Gajifian teaching, I think, in, in, in a certain sense, can be not summed up, but a way to emphasize it is that you always need to hold both of those positions together, otherwise both are useless. Um, you know, um, and so this is what Damal is really emphasizing with this book, and it's, what, it's why I think it holds a very unique place in spiritual literature as a surrealist um, a novel of analogy and allegory, and a very be and be beautifully written, by the way, and, and complexly written and densely written as well. It's a, a long read for something that's about 120 pages. Um, the reason it holds this peculiar place is is because of that, uh, the extremeness of Gajifian teaching, the 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 honesty of it, the not beating around the bush, um, being giving a, an intense amount of practical advice, often down to the to sort of the letter to do. Uh, tools and readings and possessions and resources and how difficult it's going to be and often no amount of romanticism with regards to what you're going to get the mountain is invisible where yet we somehow know it's there but of course we've never been there so we don't know what we're going to get and Gurdjieff would often emphasize this to students that you don't expect anything you might you might do these these exercises for years but don't expect anything from them because if you already knew the thing you're going to get, then you'd already know it. And so you, well, you'd already know it. And so why would you need to do it? And this is where the element of faith and I believe grace would come in here. Anyway, uh, empirically speaking, they uh, embark on a ship called the Impossible. Um, I don't know the relationship between um, Dormal and Gurdjieff in terms of his writing of Beelzebub's Tales, but of course in Beelzebub's Tales by Gurdjieff, they set out on the ship Karnak, in, uh, which is an emphasis towards um, Egyptian temples and, and uh, ancient spiritual holism. But here we have a ship called the Impossible, which is sort of quite a tongue-in-cheek cheek, um, joke in a way. And as, as this as the story progresses, each of these 12 attends to all the things that come their way in their own way, and it addresses itself in a, a holistic whole. And then we go through to a peculiar section where Domal is giving quite, um, I would say, advanced spiritual advice um, in the form of a small tale um, which is called The History of the Hollow Men and the Bitter Rose. And I'll read a section of it and then I will discuss these two ideas because I think they're, they're important with regards to just how far René Dumas got in his spiritual seeking in his life, especially with regards to the things that are of emphatic importance within the Gajifian tradition. So the history of the hollow men and the bitter rose. The hollow men live in a solid rock and move about in it in the form of mobile caves or recesses. In ice they appear as bubbles in the shape of men, but they would never venture out into the air for the wind would blow them away. They have houses in the rock whose walls are made of emptiness and tents in the ice whose fabric is of bubbles. During the day they stay in the stone and at night they wander through the ice and dance during the full moon but they never see the sun or else they would burst. 
They eat only the void, such as the form of corpses. They get drunk on empty words and all the meaningless expressions we utter. Some people say they have always existed and will exist forever. Others say that they are dead. And others say that as a sword has its scabbard or a foot its imprint, every living man has in the mountain his hollow man, which he will seek out in death. In the village of a hundred houses there lived the old priest magician Hanus and his wife Hule Hule. They had two sons, two identical twins, who could not be told apart, called Mo and Ho. Even their mother got them mixed up to tell them apart the day of name-giving. They had put on Mo a necklace bearing a little cross, and on Ho a necklace bearing a little ring. Now the story goes on, and as we go through, so we have the hollow men, and we follow these people through, and we go through to the idea of the bitter rose. Now the bitter rose is... <laughs> A peculiar thing. The bitter rose is found only at the summit of the highest peaks. Whoever eats of it finds that whenever he is about to tell a lie aloud or to himself, his tongue begins to burn. He can still feel he can still tell falsehoods, but he has been warned. A few people have seen the bitter rose. According to what they say, it looks like a large multicolored lichen or a swarm of butterflies. But no one has ever been able to catch it, for the tiniest tremor of fear anywhere close to by alerts it, and it disappears into the rock. Even if one desires it, one is a little afraid of possessing it, and it vanishes. To describe an impossible action or an absurd undertaking, they say it's like looking for night in broad daylight, or it's like trying to catch the bitter rose. Now, there's so much in um, those two ideas, the hollow man and the rose. Now, for me, the, the, the simplest explanation of the bitter rose is the notion of humility or more emphatically, honesty and humility and honesty is somewhat synonymous deep into the spiritual Christian traditions. Um, now, the bit of rose is just that you have to be honest. Uh, you have to be honest about where you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it. Even if, the, even in the sense of you might have to say that actually I'm going trying to ascend the mountain for prideful, egotistical reasons. That honesty will then in turn allow for a, uh, a, a picking away to try get something more more uh, sincere and authentic and then we have the hollow men these empty men that would be blown away by the wind and would be destroyed by light if they were to ever exit the cave I mean, we could of course draw from the cave the platonic allegory of the cave but equally we can draw uh, the platonic allegory of the cave into the gajifian conception of sleep and of um, almost like a nietzschean last last man just this this pathetic figure who has given themselves over to um, the nothingness of empty idle talk and of repetition and of sleep in the Gajifian sense and of um, somnambulism of the modern world or of whatever world they're given. And it's of importance that within Mount Analog, within that internal ascent uh, up the spiritual mountain, the hollow man is always there waiting. And Dumal, of course, says that ah, it's the man that you will you know, the, the, the spiritual seeker will meet in death, um, perhaps to overcome, or perhaps you've beaten them, perhaps you've ascended beyond it. But the, for me, the importance is that the hollow man is always there waiting. And in the sense that he's waiting, I don't think it's far away. As soon as you uh, lapse in your concentration and fall back to sleep and lose your footing, you're one and the same, and you just become that hollow man, and you can you are uh, destroyed by light. The allegory there, of course, of, of light uh, is, is for all to pry into. And then, um, as we move through these more and more um, advanced notions of spiritual seeking, we move through to a peculiar idea of uh, paradam, P-E-R-A-D-A-M. Uh, it's the first use of the word paradam in literature, which is, in short, an object revealed only to those who seek it. Which is the great paradox of the novel, and I will get to this notion of language in, in relation to that soon um, after this, but there's a reading here. One finds here, very rarely in the low-lying areas, more frequently as one far, uh, goes farther up, a clear and extremely hard stone that is spherical and varies in size, a kind of crystal, but a curved crystal, something extraordinary and unknown to the rest of the planet. 
Among the French of Port de Singe, it is called Paradam. Ivan Laps remains puzzled by the formation and root meaning of this word. It may mean, according to him, harder than diamond, and it is, or father of the diamond. And they say that the diamond is in fact the product of the degeneration of the paradigm by a sort of quartering of the circle, or more precisely, cubing of the square. Or again, the word may mean Adam's stone, having some secret and profound connection to the original nature of man. The clarity of this stone is so great, and its index of refraction so close to that of air, that, despite the crystal's great density, the unaccustomed eye hardly perceives it. But to anyone who seeks it with sincere desire and true need, it reveals itself by its sudden sparkle, like that of dewdrops. The paradigm is the only substance, the only material object, whose value is recognized by the guides of Mount Analog. Therefore, it is the standard of all currency as gold is for us. The paradigm is an acknowledgement of getting somewhere, an acknowledgement, you know, that sparkle of dewdrops. It's really a nothingness, but it's a nothingness that is known by those who have been seeking that nothingness and that invisible uh, strangeness of the spiritual ascent. <coughs> but this is really where you get to the peculiar nature of the novel and uh, to Damal's own problem in writing it and the problem of all spiritual seekers really in writing. And all of them have tried to tackle this in their own way. Uh, I, I think of novels and, and writing, which is much alike this. I think of especially the Carmelites, um, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, most emphatically are, are closest to this as, a, as a, uh, an allegorical way of spiritual seeking. And they attend to it through a, a, a blunt honesty. St. Teresa of Avila especially, and then St. John of the Cross in his simplicity. But all of these writers, and, and, and Damal especially, is in, uh, Damal especially is emphatically dealing with the problems of language in relation to what cannot be described. Uh, the, the great paradox of a visible door to the invisible. How can such a thing be? The great paradox of writing about that which cannot be written of. And in this sense, as we know from the Gospels, um, as we know from Gurdjieff's teachings, uh, um, and many other spiritual seekers, what the only way to possibly write of such things is to draw the hidden into a language which itself has a deeper layer of revealing, to imbue the symbolic and the allegorical into the writing itself as to allow the process of seeking to be within the writing. And in this sense, in this sense of a novel of the, the subtitle of the novel, Mount Analog, a novel of symbolically authentic non-Euclidean adventures in mountain climb, climbing, non-Euclidean geometry as that possible refolding and uh, um, non three uh, po like uh, post three dimensional physics where something which is greater than the visible whole is hidden within a place where it seems impossible to be hidden. Uh, very much in line with Kajifian thinking in the sense of having an emphasis on digging a ditch or sweeping up over you know, hours of saintly meditation or saintly prayer. There is an importance and something hidden non-Euclideanly non uh, within those things. Um, and then really... Uh, there is then this notion of provisions and resources once again, and then there is an idea of as they're climbing higher, they need these respirators once again, a very interesting symbol. And then really that's the the, the just to the novel quite literally finishes with the sentence. This will be unrelated here, but just to make it clear how it actually finish finishes. Without the wasps, a large number of plants which play an important part in the whole in holding the terrain in place. That's where it finishes, quite literally mid-sentence and not in some postmodern fashion, uh, much like um, something like a Pynchon novel. However, um, we are in luck because um, an, a friend of Dumal's, uh, René de uh, a, Rol, a Roland de Vreneville, uh, knew that Dumal did not have long left. He was very ill at this point and... and asked him for an outline of how the novel would go. And Amal produced a summary for him. So we do, in a way, know how the novel would have finished if he um, was to write it. This is Amal. In the fifth and sixth chapters, I plan to describe the expedition of the four quitters. Uh, you remember at the start there were four other characters, 
uh, all of whom backed out before we really got underway. In the end, however, along with a few friends, they decided to set out on their own to discover Mount Analog, for they were convinced that we had hoodwinked them. If we were out to discover this famous mountain, it was not a superior race of humanity we were after. That's why they called us jokers. They thought that the mountain must be sitting on top of oil or gold or some other treasure, and must be jealously guarded by a people who would have to be subdued. As a result, they fitted out a ver veritable warship with the most powerful and modern equipment they could find and weighed anchor. Their voyage took them through a series of adventures, and when they finally arrived within sight of Mount Analog, they prepared to un unlimber all their firepower. However, since they were completely ignorant of the laws of the place, they were caught in a whirlpool. Condemned to turn around and around in slow circles, they could still bombard the coast, but all their shells came back at them like boomerangs. It was a ludicrous fate. At the end, I want to speak at length of one of the basic laws of Mount Analog. To reach the summit, one must proceed from encampment to encampment. But before sending out for the next refuge, one must prepare those coming after to occupy the place one is leaving. Only after having prepared them can one go on up. That is why, before setting out for a new refuge, we have to go back down in order to pass on our knowledge to other seekers. Very Gajifian notion of, of preparing and uh, preparing someone preparing the next place for you, you preparing the last, this current place for the last people, etc., etc. The only way people move up is from that possibility of group work. The last chapter was going to be titled, And You, What Do You Seek? Um, of which the answers uh, would be strange. But um, as the text goes, it says, in relation really to this question, what do you seek? And Dumal asking this, answering this for himself, on one occasion he did describe in concise terms the path he saw before him. The text appears in one of the last letters he wrote me. This is how I sum up for myself what I wish to convey to those who work here with me. I am dead because I lack desire. I lack desire because I think I possess. I think I possess because I do not try to give. In trying to give, you see that you have nothing. Seeing you have nothing, you try to give of yourself. Trying to give of yourself, you see that you are nothing. Seeing you are nothing, you desire to become. In desiring to become, you begin to live. Now... It really is, in terms of, um, you don't need to know much about Gurdjieff for this. I mean, you could go read um, perhaps uh, Kenneth Walker's introduction to Gurdjieff's teachings, a study of Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff's teachings, if you wanted to have a little bit of background for Gurdjieff for this. But I think if you're into modern spirituality, which hasn't fallen uh, into the pitfalls of ridiculous New Age stuff, and uh, at the same time is a synthesis of uh, Eastern and Western thinking within the modern world, this understanding of moving towards a holism and a moving away from, uh, we could say, traditional isms into this strange world we now inhabit spiritually. Equally with this um, imbued sense of uh, intense practicality and deep history, all in a very short passage, then this book is just uh, one of the most overlooked and rare gems of spiritual literature existing in a matter of 120 pages one finds almost a blueprint for what it is to be a seeker at all there is so much hidden within the language and understanding of Damal in his uh, very short life um he was 36 when he died so that's uh, 1908 to 1944 there's so much packed in here that you realize what it can be to become in the sense of uh, Damal but this is um there's something slightly dark about it not horrifying not scary but there's something foreboding there's something unforgiving about what it is you're going to undertake if you are to undertake this seriously but for those interested uh, especially those interested in Gurdjieff this is a, a great read but for those who are spiritually inclined generally the idea of how do i get started what is it i'm even doing how can this paradox uh, of the visible and the invisible, from, from the visible to the visible, from the below to the above, how can this exist? If these questions interest you, then this is one of the most underappreciated spiritual texts that has been written. Um, and Domal is someone I feel should get a collected works volume. But that is my uh, review and analysis of, 
Rene de Mars Mount Analogue, a novel of symbolically authentic non-Euclidean adventures in mountain climbing. Thank you all for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed.